Hey there, this is Raimo. This is part 15 of my Introduction to Rust series, taking it one step at a time. This video is going to cover futures and asynchronous programming in Rust. So if you remember back to part 11, I introduced different types of input and output for Rust programs, and one of them was sending and receiving packets over the network. We used this UDP socket class, and this is sort of extracted from that example. Here we see we're creating two UDP sockets, and we're sending from one to the other. So here we're doing the send and here we're doing the receive. So just running this to demonstrate, just showing that we received the message when we sent it from one socket to the other. So as a way of introducing futures, I want to take this example and make it a little bit more complicated. Let's say we don't want to just send one message. We want to send a thousand messages. So let's first start off by defining a constant to be how many times we're going to want to send const num messages, which is some counter equals a thousand. And then next we're going to loop a thousand times sending that same message. So for something in zero to num messages, and then we're going to do the same thing for the receiver, but we're also going to count the number of times we received it and print the counter each time. So that'll help us in a little bit. So count, let's have it start out at zero and then the same loop here. But instead of saying we just re received the message, we're going to say we received some counter of messages. And let's remember to increment our counter here. Sounds great, right? This should work. We're sending a thousand copies of the message and then we're receiving a thousand messages. What could go wrong, right? Well, let's see what happens when I run this. What? It stops at 278? Why? Why? The answer is sort of twofold here. One is that with the UDP protocol, there is no guarantee of delivery. So it's possible that we might've sent the messages too quickly and some of them got dropped. But what's probably more likely here is that there's a limited amount of space in the kernel for receiving the messages before our program actually copies them back out with this receive from. So just to eliminate the possibility that we're sending too fast, let's add a little bit of a delay here after we send the message. Let's just have it sleep for a millisecond. So if you remember from a previous video, that was standard thread sleep and then standard time duration from, in this case, we're gonna do from milliseconds one. So it's gonna take a whole second to send all thousand messages, right? One every millisecond. So it takes a little bit longer to run, but we still see that we only received 278 messages. So obviously we're not sending too fast. It's just that we couldn't receive all of them. So now we're running into one problem that's gonna lead us into using futures. And that, that's how do we like, receive some of the messages while sending some other messages? So we could interleave these two, like send one, receive one, send one, receive run. But that kind of complicates our two blocks. It's really nice that we have the sending code and the receiving code separated like this. How can we keep them separated and yet let them work simultaneously? So the natural answer to that is you could either put them into two different threads or you could put them into futures or asynchronous tasks. In Rust, the word future was chosen because it kind of reflects what you're going to get out of something that's going to take a certain amount of time that's not going to be executed immediately. You could think of a future is similar to a JavaScript promise. It's just some unit of work, some function or some block of code that we're going to execute sometime later, not immediately. Along with that code, it also has any values that it's holding. So you can almost think of it as like a closure, which is kind of set up and then we can run it at some future point. So similar to how we could make a closure, we can take this block of code and put it into a block. And in this case, we're going to put another special keyword in front, which is async. And then we're going to treat that as if it was a closure or an object or something that has state. So it's going to be a itself a value. And we're going to call that the sender future. If I put a semicolon here. You'll see that the type in lay hint says it's that some implementation of future where the output is nothing. So, and this is our first introduction, our first sight of the word future. Now to work with futures, because there's only bare bones support in the language itself and in the standard library, we're going to pull in these three crates. So futures is providing some basic support on top of what Rust comes natively with. 
And then async standard is what we're going to be using in a little bit to use an asynchronous or futures version of UDP socket. And futures timer is going to do the work of our waiting for one millisecond, but asynchronously. So getting back to our code, we've kind of grouped together all the work that we want to do in sending those thousand messages into some unit of work that can be done later called the sender future. Let's do the same thing with the receiver. So it's a similar thing here. We're going to just say let receiver feature equals some asynchronous block. And that's all fine and good. And if we run this, nothing happens. Why is that? Well, we've packaged up the work to be done into what's called a feature. It's a unit of work that's going to be done at some later point. But we haven't done anything with it. In effect, we haven't consumed these futures. So let's go through one basic way in which we could actually run or consume a future. And that is through an executor. There is one that comes with the futures crate. This one that we pulled in here as a dependency. And it just takes the current thread and just runs a future on that. It's one of the simplest things we can do. So let's just make one of these that actually executes them in order. Sender and then receiver. So it's from the futures crate. It's called executor block on. And then here we also have to provide an asynchronous block. But within this block, we can now wait for these futures and get any return values that we might have out of them. So for example, we could say let some return value equals sender future dot, dot await. And the same thing for the receiver future. So now we've seen both these two new keywords, async and await, as you might guess. Async is how we mark a function or block of code so that instead of it being executed immediately and getting the return value out right away, we're setting it up to execute the work in the future. And the thing we get back is something that we can await. Future executors, like the block on that comes with futures executor, is sort of a bridge between synchronous code. Our main function in this case is not asynchronous. And asynchronous code, which is any code that needs to use the await keyword or wants to execute a block of asynchronous code elsewhere. So going over this again, we're making our sockets here. We're defining our work for sending and receiving as units of code that we're going to execute in the future. And then here we're kind of bringing it all together that on the futures executor block on basically is we're going to take over for a little bit the, the main thread from the main function and just push these two futures to completion. First the sender and then the receiver. So running this, we're back to, we sent all those thousand messages and we received 278 of them. So we're approaching the solution to our problem. Now, as I said before, what we want to do is mingle the two together. So sending and receiving at the same time. This is one of the things that futures allows you to do. We're going to use a macro that comes with the futures crate called futures join. So this is a very special macro that can take any number of futures and basically execute them at the same time. So how does that work? So we just list them here. Sender future and receiver future. It doesn't really matter the order in which we put them. And then that replaces our two awaits. If we had return values for those blocks of code, we can get them out as return values to the join. In this case, we're not needing that. And to just demonstrate this, let's run it again. And whoops, it didn't work because I did something wrong. And that's that we're still using the synchronous versions of UDP sockets. So every time we send and we receive, that actually blocks until it's done. We want to avoid using code that blocks in asynchronous code because that prevents other future blocks to be run while we're waiting. So this is where this third crate comes in. This async standard crate is what we're going to use today. There are alternatives out there, such as the Tokyo crate, which do the same thing. Basically frameworks which provide asynchronous alternatives to other libraries that are synchronous. So async standard think of as an asynchronous form of the standard library. So it, what it allows us to do is instead of standard net UDP socket, we're going to bring in async standard. But now we got to change a few things. So binding is an asynchronous operation for a socket in async standard. So we have to add an await on both our binds. And because we can't await inside of a synchronous function, we have to turn this whole block of code asynchronous. So uh, async that block. And we'll move that semicolon down there and take the let the receiver out. And then we're going to want to execute that on the main thread. So we'll do a block on around that block. And then we do the same thing for the sender. So let sender equal 
futures executor block on async. So you see what we've done here is we're using the async standard version of the UDP socket, which requires us to do an await on bind because it might block. And so therefore we had to put the whole thing it's inside an, an asynchronous block. And then to tie it into our main thread, we just use futures executor block on to just wait until that's done. So we get a receiver socket, we get a sender socket, and these are asynchronous capable sockets. A few more things we have to do here. Receive from is also potentially a blocking thing. So the asynchronous version, we would put in a wait there. And then not as obvious, more subtle here, send to also can block. So we have to put in a wait here. If we didn't, what we'd be getting back is the future unit of work to send and not actually send anything. With this await, we're basically going to make sure that that send completes before we move on in this unit of work, which is itself an asynchronous block, right? Oh, and I almost forgot there's one more thing we have to do here. This synchronous sleep needs to go away. We need to replace it with an asynchronous version of sleep. That's what this futures timer is for. That provides us an asynchronous alternative to standard thread sleep. It's called futures timer delay new. And then here we provide the amount of time to delay. And then that itself is a future, so we can await that, and then that replaces our sleep here. Now, I think that's all we need to do, so let's run it and make sure. Yep, and now we see it's working. We're actually able to send and receive those messages at the same time, and as long as we had that millisecond between sending each message, we make sure we didn't overwhelm the receiver, and they operate together pretty much simultaneous. So going into a little bit more detail about what await means, if we think of an asynchronous block or a function as a description of some work and all of the states, so it's kind of like a closure, it's something that we're going to be executing a little bit of and then going and switching to other things. And then when we switch back, we're going to resume where we left off. You can think of every time we use the await keyword, we're telling the compiler, here's a point where we might be stopped so go put this work on hold and go execute something else for a while. And when we come back, resume from that point. That makes it a lot easier to understand this code. So what's happening in the sender, for example, is that we might block sending. So while we're trying to send something, we might go and maybe wait to receive in, in the other future, or we might just sit there and do nothing. After we've sent, we're going to have another await on this artificial one millisecond delay where for one millisecond, this task is going to say, I can't do any more, so go do some other work. And when we get back, it'll be after that one millisecond has elapsed, and then we'll continue our loop. In the receiver, we had one await, and that's where we're waiting for the next message to be received. So when these two execute together in this futures join in, in the executor, what's happening is all three of these await points are places where those two blocks of work could potentially be switching. So here there are four scenarios that could be happening at any one point. Either both the sender and the receiver aren't ready to work because maybe the sender is waiting the one millisecond and the receiver hasn't received anything yet. And that's probably going to be the most typical case where that happens. Or the sender might be ready to go, so it's actively sending, but the receiver is still waiting to receive something. Or you might have the case where the sender is waiting one millisecond and the receiver is actually receiving. And... It's possible, but very unlikely, that both the sender and the receiver are actively going at the same time. So we might be receiving a message and able to send the next message at the same time. Now, what combination of things happens at any one moment of time is basically handled for us by Rust. There's safe collaboration between these two blocks of work independently from each other by simply defining them as blocks that execute on an executor asynchronously. As long as we avoid doing asynchronous blocks and any time that there might be a block, we instead do it asynchronously with an await point. Now, one footnote I should cover because you'll probably run into this just like I did. When you start taking work that you think of in a synchronous fashion, so linearly top to bottom, and you start making async blocks out of them, you have to kind of remember that we're breaking the flow through this program. It's not going to go from top to bottom here. It's actually going to jump around quite a bit between the sender and receiver future here. That has important implications when we're talking about the lifetimes of objects, especially if you start borrowing references and carrying those borrows into asynchronous blocks. You're going to run into a lot of cases where you run afoul of the borrow checker. Now, why? Well, if you think about that we're jumping around the, from place to place in the code and we're not going through in a linear fashion anymore, it might kind of make more sense because 
a lot of times asynchronous blocks extend the lifetimes of things that you normally wouldn't realize. So for example, this buffer and this counter, they don't just fall out of scope by the time we get out of this block. They persist as long as that future exists, which is all the way down to the end of our program here. So a lot of times the way to approach lifetime issues with asynchronous code is simply to use objects that are owned or that have static lifetimes or have lifetimes that are pretty long. So for example, all of this work wraps up at the end of our main function. So as long as we're only borrowing things that can live as long as our main function, we're going to be good. But especially if you have complex combinations of asynchronous work, try to avoid a lot of borrows and short lifetimes because you'll probably end up with an asynchronous block that wants to keep a reference longer than you intended. So I hope you enjoyed this first exposure to futures. And that pretty much wraps up all of the core things about Rust that I wanted to cover in this series. I might come out with a future video to shore up the introduction with some miscellaneous topics that I didn't cover, or maybe based off of the feedback I get on these videos. I hope you enjoyed this series, and I'll see you next time. Bye.